The podcast for the inquisitive diver. Hey there, dive buddies, and welcome to the show. There's a number of common subjects that's spoken about in diving, including where is the best place to dive in the world? Now, that question is extremely difficult to answer because there are many factors to consider logistics, availability, what you envisage getting out of the adventure, diver experience, and above all, safety. I personally have a number of locations that I consider to be the best in the world, but I also have many more to dive that others would consider to be better. One of those most overlooked locations I've had the pleasure of diving and working is Papua New Guinea. Today, I am joined by a man who has dived in PNG multiple times over the last 20 years and has authored Indo-Pacific Images, arguably the most detailed website for scuba divers wishing to find information on this amazing country. During today's episode, we take a trip through PNG and refer to our personal experiences to dispel common fears, highlight particular locations, what to expect when diving, and how to get there. Actually, I'm 100% confident that you won't find a more detailed podcast regarding diving in Papua New Guinea at all. And so, without further delay, Mr. Don Silcock, welcome to the show, buddy. Thank you, Matt. Good to be here. How are you you keeping? Uh, Pretty good, actually. I'm I'm excited about this opportunity to... uh to come on your show and talk about some of the stuff that I've done, particularly in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, some of the stuff you've done. Some? some? You've done loads. You've been everywhere. I'm just looking on the website, and we've got Australia, obviously, Papua New Guinea, Timor, Tonga, Japan, Americas, Africa, Azores. And I've got to point out to everyone who's listening, this fella has just nailed it when it comes to photography and underwater diving. Um, the two go hand in hand. I've not really talked about it much on previous episodes um i've been waiting for this uh, this young man to come into the studio and talk all about it um and where do you want to start don um how about how about where you started how did you get into diving um well actually i uh, I, I, i've been <laughs> i'm almost scared to say when i started diving but it was 1978 i was a young guy a young guy back then i was still in nappies i think uh, yeah yeah okay you rub it in <laughs> So I, I was just always, I've always been fascinated by uh, diving and uh, completely uh, fascinated and drawn into underwater photography. Um, and, you know, it, it was, you had to learn to dive first and then you had to get a camera and cameras were as expensive then relative as, as they are now, you know, so it was a big step to get your first camera. Mm. And of course you're shooting film back then and the, the learning curve was horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Uh, it took me years before I actually got a result. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's just gone from there, really, uh, as you go through each stage of your life and you travel. I travel a lot. I've been traveling basically all my life, and um, that opened up opportunities to go other places, you know, and 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 one thing led to the other. And then um, I made my first trip to Papua New Guinea, which is, I think, is the main topic of this uh, of this chat. Um that was uh, 20 years ago. I uh, I finally made it there, and, you know, I've been back. Uh, I was there when COVID broke out big time last March, and that was my 24th trip in, <laughs> in 20 years. So I've been all, all over uh, Papua New, New Guinea. But I've also done a lot of stuff in Indonesia, and, and in normal times, I, I live in Indonesia. I live in Bali. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah, just one thing leads to another and you know your life takes you on this journey and um i've just been always been fascinated by it all that's uh, the basic thing Where, whereabouts in bali are you changu changu yeah okay yeah yeah i've got quite a few mates over there i think most aussies have got a few mates over there they? <laughs> <laughs> and if you haven't just go there you'll make some but uh yeah, yeah i mean uh uh changu is a very popular area the problem is it's a long way from the diving all the good diving is up in the north yeah and although it's physically not that far uh the roads and all the rest of it mean that you know it's a bit of a challenge to get around so uh when i when i go dive and i go for a couple of days it's yeah. difficult to go for one day in bali yeah yeah I've got a good mate of mine over on Nusa Panita, Jason Fondis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard of him, yeah. He yeah. loves it. He's, he's as mad as a box of frogs. He's hilarious. <laughs> so it, as and when you get home, get over there and have a <laughs> okay, dive. Okay, I will it's, do, yeah. It's very entertaining. <laughs> I've not heard that saying for a long time, mad as a box of frogs. Uh, uh, and you're from St. Helens, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, well, I, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, St. Helens is in the northwest of England, and not far from there is where I grew up, a place called Roncon. 
which if you ever go, you'll know why I live in Bali. <laughs> but, yeah, the bridge isn't as good as the uh, Sydney <laughs> Bridge, is it? <laughs> uh, well, it's made of steel, and uh, that's that's about it. You know, you, you um, yeah. <laughs> hey, I've got to say cheers because you're the first yes. guest that I've had in the studio whilst we're having a a, a, a bit of uh, mountain goat beer. That's uh, cheers, w- cheers. What's, what's a host you are. <laughs> mm. Good, it is as well. Um, so, 20 years ago, was it 20 years ago? 24 years ago? 20, 20 years ago, I first went to Papua New Guinea, yeah. Right. And wh- what was the, how was it to travel there going back that long or that far? <laughs> <laughs> it must have been a bit of a logistical nightmare. Uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, everybody's got, everybody who's been to Papua New Guinea has a story about traveling there. Um, I estimated that probably 20% of the time I've been there, something has happened to me. Uh, Either it's cancelled flights or postponed flights or whatever. Uh, But, you know, you always get there. They always manage to get you there, and the operators know how to deal with all that. So whilst it is a bit intimidating, um, that side of it, the travel side of it, uh, and it still is to a degree, um, you, you, you manage your way through it. Basically, you manage your way through it, and it's it's um, at times it can be quite fraught. You think, "Oh my goodness," you know, I booked this boat or whatever, you know. But they always find a way to, you know, to deal with it, and yeah. and you get there. The, 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 the basic problem is that uh, the main carrier is Air New Guinea, and Air New Guinea is greatly maligned. But the point is that they have a limited capacity. And they're busy, and if something happens, one of the airports has a problem or something, everything ball waves up, mm-hmm. and then you get these cancellations, and it'll affect you. And so, but they get what they do is they put the flights on early in the morning, and they get you out, and they move you around. Mm. So, you know, whilst it's great, <laughs> and you're going to get great, greatly maligned. It's not as bad as they say, yeah. you know. It's it's a bit like the everybody's heard about safety and danger and the rascals in Papua New Guinea again. Um, you know, there are issues there, but I've never had a problem. Yeah. All the t- every time I've been there, you know, I just use my common sense and I've never had a problem. Well, since you mentioned it, I think that's one of the things that we need to get out of the way first when we're talking about Papua New Guinea because it is an absolutely stunning location, especially for the diving, even above surface, you know, when you're looking around. Phenomenal. It's a beautiful country and, and the people are great too. Um, but it does get that bad rep for Port Moresby and the rascals. And for anyone who doesn't understand what a rascal is, uh, it's basically street robbers um, that are armed. Um, and they do exist, but as Don rightly says, as long as you are sensible and you're not pissing it up and walking down the street at 10 o'clock at night on your own, then you're not going to have much of an issue. You know, plan your, plan your trip, plan the route and the location that you're going to go to and be sensible. That's that's it in a nutshell, isn't it? That's basically it. You, you, there are areas of Port Moresby you should not go to mm. under any circumstances, unless you you know you, you're just passing through in a car driven by somebody who knows yeah. how to deal with it. You know, places like Six Mile and what have you are, mm. are basically squatter camps. Yeah. Um, the, 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 let me define what a rascal is because mm. it sounds sure. and it's, it's spelt with a K. Rascal. Uh, the Life in Papua New Guinea is away from the the, the, the main cities, where the biggest city is Port Moresby, which is still quite small compared to, you know, uh, Australian standards uh, for cities or European standards. Um, but away from that, it's subsistence living. You can you can grow and catch more or less most of the things you need. Yeah. But it's and it, you know there's a whole village system there that functions very well, and you can catch and grow whatever you need. You can, what you need is money for luxuries, and luxuries is thing, are things like soap and cooking oil and things like that, which are quite expensive. Yeah. So people, you know, make do. But if you would, a lot of, particularly young men, think they're going to break out and they go to the cities, thinking that somehow they're going to get a job, mm-hmm. and they haven't got any skills, and you know they've got there's no social network, social support, so they end up in these gangs, basically, and they survive by robbery. Yeah. But the people who get robbed the most are the locals. 
The expats are living in their compounds with barbed wire everywhere, which is, is intimidating when you see it. But they've got the security, and and all expats have some kind of a horror near-miss story, but they're near-misses more than anything. Yeah, Things do happen, but it's unlikely, hmm. right? The people who really suffer are the locals who live side by side with these rascals. And and they're the people, you know, they're the people we should feel sorry for. Now, if you go to those areas, you're asking for trouble. Yeah. If you go to those areas with somebody who knows how to, you know, you can do that. I have actually done that. Mm. Right? I wouldn't go by myself. But I've been with people who locals who know who is a rascal and who isn't a rascal because they don't have a T-shirt, they don't have a, buy- <laughs> they don't have a calling card. <laughs> Big neon sign yeah, on the yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, rascals <laughs> are us. You know, that, that, that's you, you, you're hard to tell who's who, yeah. right? But the locals know who they are. So, and they'll watch you back, mm. you know, and I, I've done that. And I'm here, you know, nothing happened to me. I was, was scary moments, but that's because I was there, but I wouldn't have gone by myself. Yeah. If you know what I mean. Yeah, right? for sure. So if you avoid it, you avoid, you cut out 99% of the problems, mm-hmm. right? So you get to your hotel, you're perfectly safe in your hotel. You know, they, they transport you back into the airport. And once you're, you know, once you're out of Moresby, the, the, you know, there's a couple of other, but Ley and Garoka up in the mountains has a bit of reputation. But more or less, you know, again, if you follow the basic rules, you, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. I, I repeat, I've never had a problem. Yeah. And uh, I mean, for people who haven't listened into a, an episode before, um, I lived there for a year, and uh, I never had a problem either. Um, and I did go out for a few beverages in Port Moresby on quite a few occasions. <laughs> right. <laughs> Big shout out to my drinking buddies over there, Jordy. Um, yeah. So, rascals, just be sensible. Just Take be sensible. Us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't go. You know. Um, don't walk around with a flash watch and a camera and, you know, because mm. then it, most of that, what crime does exist is random. Yeah. They see an opportunity to strike. Mm. So if you're walking around with a flash camera or a visibly bulging wallet in your back pocket, mm. you're asking for trouble. Yeah. But don't do that and, you know, keep your wits about you and, and you're fine. You can go, you can, you can go out mm. in those safe areas, mm. but don't, you know, don't visibly show off in any way. That's right. In case there's, you know, a random encounter. Yeah. Well, I, I generally find with the expeditions that I plan and take over there that we, we fly in, land in Port Moresby, and it's usually late afternoon, early evening, get into the hotel, have some food and get to bed, and then you're back to the airport in the morning to that's fly right. out to the resorts or boats that you're going to go to. Yeah, and and the the that's that's kind of the worst case. The best mm. case is that if you plan it well, you can Australia flying from Australia into New Guinea. It's perfectly possible to leave Sydney in the morning, early morning, yeah. through Brisbane into Moresby, make your connecting flight, and be at the resort that night. Yeah, all in one day. You know, the worst case you'll have to stay over. Yeah, but you, you can, and I've done it many times. Um, but <laughs> that's it's the afternoon when the flight problems occur. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's kind of, uh, there is a risk, uh, and I would put the risk at 20%. Yeah. That you, something, you know, you might get caught at the airport, the flight gets cancelled. Yeah. I mean, I, I might risk it if I was going on my own or it was me and the missus. But right, right. if it's, you know, pulling people in from all over the world, right. no chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I would agree with that completely. I, I, if, I was, if I was leading a, a trip or something like that, I would err on the side of caution and stay in, in Moresby overnight. But like you say, by the time you get in, you get you know transferred to your, your, your hotel, get some to eat, it's bedtime, up early in the morning, and away you go. Mm, mm. And, and the, the flights are very reliable in the morning. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. And it's pretty cool as well because it's relatively small planes as well, isn't it? Yeah. Just up in the air, yeah. straight back down, job yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... The very first trip, what was the first destination you went to? I went to Milne Bay, uh, and that's an interesting story in itself because uh, prior to coming to Australia, I lived in the Middle East for um, 14 years, different places. But the last seven of those years, I was in Bahrain. And uh, it was round about, would have been 88. 
I saw, I used to get the National Geographic magazine, mm. you know, a paper. <laughs> <laughs> One of those things that are you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. barely in existence. Yeah, they? yeah. Uh, I used to get that, uh, subscribe to that, and it used to come to where we lived in, in Bahrain. And I used to look forward to it so much because it was like a different world you could see there, you know. Yeah. And uh, the front cover, I think it was in April 88, it was David Dubliet's image of a wrecking in uh, uh, Papua New Guinea. And the article was all about these different places. And I saw that and I thought, wow, this is, you know, this is incredible. You know, yeah. I didn't even know where it was. I didn't know where <laughs> Papua New Guinea was. Honestly, didn't. To be point. honest, when I got when I heard about the job yeah. uh, to, before I got over there, yeah. I, I did have to have a look on the atlas because I, I had no bloody <laughs> clue as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you know, where is it? Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I went to Milne Bay and, um, uh, I, that was, I was hooked, you know, it was, for me, it was just this unique, people say to me, what, what's, why do you like Papua New Guinea? Mm. And the best way I can describe it is it's kind of like, as an Australian, I am an Australian now, despite my accent. <laughs> um, it's kind of like our Africa, mm. you know, it's completely opposite to Australia. Australia is the great brown land down under. Yeah, you know, not a lot of mountains. Um, you know, not many volcanoes. <laughs> Whereas you get to you get to um, Papua New Guinea and the the main island of New Guinea, uh, New Guinea Island, mm-hmm. the eastern half, and then over in New Britain. Uh, I mean, it's dense rainforest, huge mountains, uh, volcanoes. You know, it's on the Pacific Ring of Fire. That's why it's that's why it is like it is, mm. and it's it's a uh, it's a phenomenal place. And then you've got all the tribes and the tribal cultures and the languages, you know, over 850 languages, a thousand different ethnic, you know, cultural groups. Mm. It's an amazing place, the the, the diversity. But the, the easiest way I can describe it is it's our Africa. It's a wild, exotic, completely different place. Yeah. And that's what kind of hooked me. And then there's great diving. Oh, do you remember, do you remember the first dive you did there? Uh, yes, I did actually. It was in uh, it was in Deacon's Reef, uh, which is where uh, David Dubliet took some iconic images, and um, that's on the north coast of uh, of Milne Bay. So that's where we went to first, as it happened, and I, I vividly remember it. You know, it was, uh, and I had the pleasure of diving there multiple times since. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I tell you what, let's let's why don't we just do a, like a, a a stop around the country? So Milne Bay. You'd have stayed at Tawali? Yep, I've done Tawali and I've done the liverboards in, in Milne Bay. Okay. Oh, which, which ones? Well, back in the day, uh, there was a, uh, a liverboard called, called Golden Dawn, which is Craig DeWitt. Yep. Uh, he still has the board, but he doesn't, he does. He, he just does specific charters now. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the boats that was operating there. Then uh, Mike Ball was operating there for a while. Okay. Uh, with Spoil Sport, I believe it was. And but the the if you like the anchor boat that's always been there is uh, Rob Van, Van der Luzzi's boat, Churton. Okay. So I've been on Churton a few times, and Rob's a great guy. Nobody basically nobody knows Milne Bay as well as he does now. Yeah. Uh, he built Rob Van der Luz was the partner in the construction of Tuwali. Right. Um, and the idea was, you know, to have that lodge mm-hmm. on the north coast there, where you hand it for all the those north coast sites, mm. and you can do it by day boat. Um, so yeah, M- Milne Bay is it, Milne Bay was what got Papua New Guinea on the map diving. Okay. Mainly through the uh, the work of Bob Holstead, the late Bob Holstead. He died a couple of years ago. Yeah. But Bob launched the first liverboard in um, uh, in Papua New Guinea, which was the Talita. Uh, built locally, mm-hmm. uh, built in Papua New Guinea in Port Moresby, um, and you know that was in the that was the boat that David Dubliet was on. Right. When he wrote his article. It was only a small boat. Uh and and the first liverboard and Bob charted all this all these sites mm. in Milne Bay area. But what was unique about Bob was he was a good photographer and he was a good writer. Mm. So he started sending his articles out to all the dive magazines, you know, around the world with great images. Yeah. And he was he he could describe it superbly. Yeah. And that's what kind of caught everybody's attention and you know, people started to go to Papua New Guinea and it built out from there. Mm-hmm. So that was, so Milne Bay is on the eastern tip of the main island 
of uh, of New Guinea. You know, the islands called New Guinea. It's the second biggest island in the world. Yeah. The eastern half of the island is Papua New Guinea, the mainland of Papua New Guinea. Mm-hmm. The western half is Papua Barra or Irian Jaya or, you know, the, the, the it's Indonesia, basically. And the far eastern tip, northeastern tip, that's where Raja Ampat is. Yes. So, and the reason it's all good is because you've got this force of nature called the North, Indonesian North fruit eastern, North, Northwest. North, sorry, northwestern. Yeah. Northwestern tip of... Uh, New Guinea Island yeah. is Rajarampa. Yeah. And the reason it's all good is because the currents that go through there bring in all the goodness from the uh, Pacific basins that call it. Yeah. There. You got, there's two, is it two that's converging over the... The, the? the main one that hits from the north is what's called the Indonesian through flow, which is the largest volume of water in the world. And it carries with it it goes through the eastern half of Indonesia and it also guns down, runs down the north coast of New Guinea Island. Mm. And the Indonesian through flow is the life source, if you like, of what we call the Coral Triangle. Right. And the epicenter of the Coral Triangle is the eastern Indonesia Mm -hmm. and Papua New Guinea, but it also goes out over into, you know, the Solomons and down into Timor and whatever. But that's the, you know, it's the richest marine biodiversity in the world. Yeah. And, and the uh, the place that gets it first, if you like, is Raja Ampat, mm-hmm. right? But that current also goes down the north coast. And, and the thing that's really special about Papua New Guinea is you've also got the um, uh, eastern equatorial current, sorry, the southern equatorial current that mm-hmm. comes in the other way. And it all mixes up there. And that's why Papua New Guinea is so biodiverse, because you've got those two very rich currents there, that are delivering all this eggs, lava, and nutrients, and yeah, that's why it's so phenomenal. Yeah, and that's the word phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's very phenomenal. difficult to try and put into words um, how insane a dive is there. Mm. Yeah, but, can um, be, can be if you're in the right be. place. Yeah, um, I mean, like anywhere, if it's rubbish weather, it can be absolutely crap as well. But um, the on the biodiversity front. Um, I do remember my very first dive on the outer reefs, and I came up from a... What, a two feet. Se- yeah, two yeah. feet. A 70, 80-minute dive, something like that. I came up, and my eyeballs felt like they'd done a 10-hour workout in the gym. <laughs> the muscles at the back of my eyes just didn't know what was going on, because I was just... <laughs> yeah. So much to look at in all directions. Yes. And when you say all directions, it is all directions. 360 degrees, every right. single degree that's on there. Right. Fantastic. Um Oh, um, Tuali. Before we move on from Tuali, what's the what's the what would you say is the attraction to to Tuali? What what kind of diver would go to Tuali? Well, you've got a bit of both there. Uh, in, you know, the in underwater photography, we talk about macro and wide angle. Mm-hmm. You know, so wide angle is the the bigger things, the nice reefs, the seascapes, uh, etc. And macro is obviously all the critters. So you've got both there on on the north coast. Uh, the the the, the dive site I just talked about, Deacon's, uh, Deacon's Reef, just it, that's on the headland, and that's a, very much a wide-angle dive with fantastic corals and the chance of big stuff out in the blue. You get hammerheads, you get mantas, you know, you get all sorts of stuff passing through uh, in the blue. And then, But just round the corner um, and in the bay is Loadi, or um, Diners Beach, as it's called, which is one of the, you know, famous muck dives. What, that's where, but that's, that's actually where muck diving was in, was the term muck diving was christened. That so, was, so that was Bob, Bob Holstead. See, is it? Because I've had, you know, when you look through articles and stuff like that, and you listen to stuff, the amount of places now that claim no, that they're the no, no, the no, let, origins let, of the muck diving. No, let thing. me tell you that story. Go for it. So when when Bob Holstead was operating his boat to Lita, right mm-hmm. now Bob's wife Dinah. It's from Lawari, that village of Lawari, gotcha. right? That's a, that's a home village. And Bob uh, had uh, a party of well-heeled American divers led by a guy called Carl Rossler, mm-hmm. who was one of the very early trip leaders. He was taking well-heeled Americans on these adventures, right? And one of, one of the places he went to was Papua New Guinea on Bob, Bob's boat. 
And Bob was trying to persuade them that they'd done Deacon's Reef and saw all this wonderful wide-angle stuff. Then Bob was trying to say, well, look, if you go in here, there's all these critters, you know, and but they, they, they look, you know, they didn't look very nice, right? Yeah. So Bob come up with the term muck diving, which is diving where there isn't anything nice to see, big, big scenic wise, you know. Mm. But there's all these critters. Mm. But they thought he was just trying to save petrol. These, <laughs> they thought he was trying to save fuel. Yeah, they didn't. He didn't want to go anywhere else. Yeah. So there was this big conflab, and I heard that Bob told me the story directly, and he's written about it a lot. Uh, and he. He persuaded. He said, "Well, just do one dive, and you don't like it. We'll come up with it." And he said that they went in and they stayed there for two days because <laughs> <laughs> there were so many critters and stuff to yeah. see. Yeah. Right? And and it was also there where Bob came up with his theory of why critters will be in a certain location. So what he says is, you need a, a sheltered area like a bay mm-hmm. close to deep water because you get the upwellings coming up, yeah. and you need a source of uh, organic nutrients as well. So you need a stream nearby, but you don't want a river. Yeah. You want a stream that provides organic nutrients, you know, and in, inorganic, I guess, uh, from the uh, from the villages. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and it all mixes up, and that's why... And you typically black sand. Yes. Right? And Luardi, or Diners Beach, had all that. Yeah. Right? And that's where that muck diving turn came from. Gotcha. Now everybody everybody uses it now. It's like you know whatever you know. Yeah. But, uh, it's a generic term, and yes, a lot of people. It's like I guess success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan, right? So uh, that you know that caught on, and um, everybody uses it now. But that's where it came from. It's Bob Holstead. Yeah. So there you go, ladies and gents. You've heard it first hand, almost <laughs> first hand. But muck diving. The origins of that phrase is Papua New Guinea. Done. Yeah, so uh, to, to Ali, you can you can. There's a very very nice lodge, all self-contained, all uh, well done, and you can do boat diving. Mm-hmm. To all you, you can get to Deacons, it's like twenty minutes. Just just off from uh, to Ali is um, Wahoo Point, which is just wonderful. You get these massive elephant ear sponges and like a terrace going down. You know, there's the coral gardens further going further west. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a you know eight to ten coastal dives and then if you go to the east and you can get out to you know there's some seamounts out there yeah uh, by day boat so you're back you know so if if you were traveling with your family and they didn't want to dive you know they could stay in the resort there's a swimming pool and all that sort of stuff and uh, or you know you, if you want to just want to do a couple of dives you want to do three dives you can do that yeah. Yeah. You can dive the house reef. You do the night dive. Yeah. So you you can do it from, you know, from Tuali, which is um, you know quite special for for Milne Bay. It's the only thing like that in Milne Bay. Yeah. The, the only thing with, you know, with Tuali is that you're limited as such to those dive sites. Yeah. So the perfect Milne Bay trip would be to do Tuali and then go on one of the liverboards. Gotcha. Now currently there's two liverboards. Uh, service in the area. There's Jordan, mm-hmm. Rob van der Loos, and Oceana relocates from Kimby Bay. That's the new boat there. It's yeah. a fa- fabulous boat. Uh, Dan Johnson is the uh, the skipper and owner. So he ro- relocates uh, to Milne Bay in January, February, March. Okay. And uh, operates, you know, in the Milne Bay area. And that means you can then get down to the south through the China Strait Mm. And the best place in in Papua New Guinea to see mantas is down there, a place called uh, Gonabarabara Island. Was that where Adam was diving to get the Adam beard? Did you ever meet yeah, him? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I've never met him. I, I, I know, yeah. But that, that, that's the best place for mantas is yeah. uh, uh, Giant Saros is, is the nickname of the site. Uh, great place. It's a cleaning station. Gotcha. Yeah, he was desperately trying to set up um, like a manta... Um, what's the phrase? I suppose almost like a foundation, really, kind of trying to protect them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think uh, there was a lot of things against him politically in country, yeah. uh, unfortunately. Um, so you say Oceana. Uh, Oceana and Chetan. 
Yeah, and then Oceana moves up to Wellindy, does it? So, so what? Uh, in at the end of sorry, early January, mm. uh, Dan relocates the boat down to uh, to goes you know along the north coast of uh, New Britain, mm. then down into Milne Bay and bases himself, bases the boat there for about two and a half months, which is a peak season, a peak. Big time, really great time to be there. Okay, and then comes back up and goes along the south coast of New Britain. Gotcha. Which is a very remote location, up into Rabal, and then back round to Kimby Bay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that um, that time of year for Mil is prime for Milne Bay, because that's going into isn't that going into the trade winds, because it starts to get a bit. But but Milne Bay is almost a, a year round location, you know, because it's yeah. sheltered. Okay. Um, you know, it, it, you know, the the um, I, I would classify it as a, a year round location, but you've got to watch the weather. You know, yeah. W- one side of the bay will be good when another side isn't. Gotcha. So if you um, the, the the negative, if you like, of being in Tuali is if you get uh, the winds in the wrong direction. Most of the sites will be blown out. Gotcha. And that's what you, what can you do? Yeah. Right. Whereas with the liverboard, you can move around. So if one side of the bay is not good, you can go to the other or down south or whatever. How, how big is the bay? Oh, it's big. A um, couple, it, couple of k. Oh no 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 no. It take you uh, to get from one end to the other. Um, six hours. What? Yeah, it's quite it's big. It's a big bay. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah, it's a big bay, and um, uh, to get you know, I'm that's on a liverboard, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. So, so you're not, you're not, you know, you're not, you're not, um, you're not, you're not it. <laughs> right? You know, up on the on the plane on the liverboard, but but you know, it, it's it's um, it's a substantial size. It's a mm-hmm. large bay, and uh, with all the islands around there and the currents to go through through there, you know, there's always somewhere sheltered. Yeah. Uh, where you can get to, and it's so biodiverse that you know there's always a good place mm. that you can get to if if you're on the liverboard. Yeah. So the yeah. perfect trip would be, you know, to you know to do your day diving in Tuali, then get on the liverboard and go down south and get to the places that you can't get to. Yes. And do uh, does Tuali operate up as far as the the blackjack? Well, you need that. You need <laughs> a good question. Um, uh, the, the problem is getting up there and getting back. Yeah. So um, the way I've done it, uh, blackjack. I've done it uh, uh, three times now, mm. twice by liverboard and once from two feet. Yeah. You know, uh, two feet. You can do it in a day. It's a big day. Yeah. A long day, as you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it's a long day, but um, you can. Uh, but really, the best way of doing it is by liverboard. Yes. And um, the Blackjack, uh, ladies and gents, is um, is one of the most iconic World War II wrecks um, in Papua New Guinea and, dare I say, the world. Um, she sits in uh, 48 metres of water off the village of Boga Boga. Yeah. And um, it is just an awe-inspiring Wreck dive. It's like a scene from a Hollywood movie when you first dive down. You, 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 it's it looks like completely intact. It's been underwater over sixty years now. Yeah, and it's just sat there on this sandy seabed. And obviously, when you get close, it's not intact. But you know, it's not you know mm. pristine. But it looks it as you're going down. You think, wow, you know, this is like this is like a Hollywood movie. You know. Yeah. Have you heard the story of how it was discovered? I have. But do please tell for those that are listening. So um, uh, there's a guy in Papua New Guinea called Rod Pierce who is he's the the wreck demon. Have you ever, have you ever met him, Rod? I've never met him. No, yeah, he's, no but yeah. I've heard him, of him many times. Yeah, he's a, he's a, Papua New Guinea is full of characters, but yes. uh, Rod's <laughs> Rod's a real character, you know, and. Uh, uh, he just lives for Rex, mm. and they reckon he's been bent more times than you know than he wishes to uh, count because of all the wreck diving he's done. But he's mm. discovered a lot of the wrecks in Papua New Guinea. Um, his boat is the Barbarian, very well named, <laughs> <laughs> small. Yeah, the Barbarian. You say, <laughs> I don't need to say any more, really. Um, but um, 
he, um, I saw him in Rabaul actually last year, uh, just before um, um, on my last trip there. Yeah. He was packed up in uh, Rabaul. I was chatting to him. Um, so he uh, and two other guys were searching for a wreck that they, the villagers had told. There was a guy called Alistair Pennyfather, I think his name was, um, who had heard from villagers in the area that there was, you know, a big wreck out there, an airplane had come down during World War II. Mm. And they thought it was uh, an Australian uh, A6 Havoc, I think it's called, because that had gone down in that general area. One of those had gone down in that general area um, and had never been found. Mm. So Rod Pierce was actually diving just off the fringing reef, swam round the corner, and there was Blackjack. Yeah. But he didn't know it was Blackjack. He just knew it was a B-17. Yeah. Well, uh, you can't miss it, can you? Well, you Massive. can't miss it. But, you know, can you imagine just swimming around? <laughs> this is like, you know, the, the guy spent his life, dedicated his life yeah. to finding wrecks. Well, it's got to be a eureka moment. I mean, you think of all the wrecks that you find and it's just a lump of metal in some sand. Yeah. I right. had to see that thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was some kind of a wreck. But this was, like, completely intact. Yeah. That at that point in time, had sat there for like I don't know forty five, fifty years when he found it. Yeah, and that you know it was anyway. They they um, they dived it, and one of them managed to get in and in inside the wreck and mm-hmm. make all the way up to the cockpit and got the call sign. Gotcha. And that's how they identified it as the blackjack. Yeah. Now what they found out was that the pilot on that day, his name was Ralph Deloach. Mm-hmm. After the war, he'd actually become a Marlboro man. You remember? Years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, the the good-looking guys around the house. Yeah. Out. <laughs> he'd become a Marlboro man, right? And he'd retired, and he was living in Southern California somewhere, and they found him. Get out of it. They found him, and they took him back. Is it back to P&G? Back to Boga Boga. <laughs> and there were still people in the village who, you know, because when when he put the plane down, he actually, the co-pilot put the plane down because he'd mm. never ditched before. Mm. But his co-pilot That's had, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the, the co-pilot put it down, but he had to bail out quick. And it was like three minutes and the plane sank. So they got out and they'd missed the edge of the reef, mm. right? But all the villagers paddled out in the canoes and, you know, they got them all. And there was still somebody there alive in the village who was part of that. Uh, uh, and so Ralph met, you know, and they made a film about it. There's actually uh, a film was made about it. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, it's a really interesting story uh, and, and a fantastic wreck. But it's um, it's challenging, you know, 48 metres, there's mm-hmm. currents there, uh, you're very remote, yeah. you know, that's why it's best to dive from a liverboard and, yeah. um, you know, you take your time and, you know, you've got all the support you need there. Yeah. Well, we used to, we used to do it, well, I've done it quite a few times, I had a two feet. Um, but it is a, a bit of a, a logistical effort to get down there yeah. and back, as you know, and it takes yeah. a lot of fuel. A lot of fuel, and yeah. you know, it's you know a long way. You got across the uh, what, what's the bay called? Um, yeah. Anyway, the big the big bay, the big yeah. bay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, big, the big bay is not as big as Melbourne Bay, but yeah. big enough. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, I forget what it's called now. And um, yeah, you got to cut across there. So obviously, you need the weather and mm. the weather changes while you're out, and you, you know you've got a lumpy ride back. And, yeah. yeah. Well, as a few, I think, in fact, all of the occasions that I've done it, um, we've gone out on the boat to the location, and then on the way back up to Tufi, they've had to send out an additional boat to bring us some more fuel. Really? Yeah. It's um, yeah. It's a long old trip, yeah. but it's worth it. Fantastic dive, mm. absolutely fantastic. But you know, uh, logistically challenging. Yeah, I filmed it back in when would it be? Um, two thousand eighteen, I think. Mm. Yeah, um, I managed to get some some very good video footage of it and make a little video out of it. Which went a bit gangbusters once I put it online. Oh yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely one for the uh, bucket list. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um, and soon we're talking about. We just pop two feet in there nicely. Yeah, yeah. Two feet. What, what a wonderful place. Beautiful. You, you've place. been there a few times. Yes. Haven't you? Yeah. I spent quite a bit of time. Been fortunate enough to spend uh, weeks there. Uh, not as you know, not, not the years that you've spent there, <laughs> but you know, long enough to get develop a, a great appreciation for it. And uh, I mean, just the journey itself, getting there, coming or going over the top of the the, the Owen Stanley Range. You know, you mm. look out. You know, I mean, it's wow. You know, uh, 
that's quite a journey over. And then you, you, beautiful location, those um, uh, fields, or uh, I think the connect geologically, the right name is Rhea. Yeah. Rears, because they're not actually a fjord, but, you know, it sounds good, doesn't it? It does. Tropical, <laughs> fjord, tropical fjord. But, yeah, uh, incredibly scenic uh, place and, and uh, two feet large. I mean, you, fantastic location, you know, yeah. it's just brilliant. And, uh, and yeah, you've got all the nice diving um, around, you know, muck diving, obviously, around the jetty because mm. there's – there's a lot of flotsam and jetsam there over the years, uh, oh, yeah. but all the critters love it. And so it's a great, great place to go muck diving. And then you know, there's some nice dives if you can get on them in the, in the fjords, but there's access is a, can be a problem because. Mm. Um, you, go, you go down to see all the wreckage down the bottom of the. Yeah, uh, yeah, I've done yeah. the, uh, done the uh, PT boats and mm. the uh, and the Land Rover that's down there and all the beer crates. I always wondered whether the beer crates were related, were in the Land Rover when he went in. <laughs> <Yeah>. I, don't, <laughs> I don't know, but yeah, the um, the PT boats are interesting. Okay, but again, that's fifty meters. It's mm. uh, it's challenging, but uh, but for me, that the, the the best part of uh, Tufi are the offshore reefs, which yes. you know. To put this in perspective, you've got dozens of these reefs offshore right in the path of where that Indonesian through flow flows down the north coast of the north east coast of New Guinea Island. So mm. that's why they're so rich. Um, and, they're, they're, you know, there's just some spectacular dives there. Um, again, uh, you need the weather. Um you, you know when the wind blows around August September isn't it September oh it's a lot earlier than that um, April onwards oh really so yeah. three four months from April right. then you get the um, south easterlies coming up the trade right. winds right and it makes it really really difficult to get yeah. out onto the right. uh, reefs so it, it becomes very difficult when customers are expecting to go out and see right. leucistic hammerheads and right. god knows what else and they've just got to stay in the fjords because it's unsafe. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you're really exposed once you go once you go out of the fjord and then you're out. I mean, you're really exposed, and mm. uh, you know. So uh, well, something like Veal's Reef is yeah. 21k offshore. Yeah, it's a long way out, and <laughs> uh, but it's fantastic when you, you know if you if you if you go the right time of the year and you get the the calm weather mm. and uh, the the blue water, it's just phenomenal. It's very. It, you know, not many other boats, apart from the resorts boats, go out there. Yeah, there's only obviously the only day boats that go out there from the resort, but the, the liverboards occasionally go through, but you know, not very often. Yeah, there's very few of them that actually dive the reefs, is there? That's right. Yeah, um, but it is. It's simply amazing. I mean, good times to go. I would say November through to end of March. Don't, don't, that's when I've been there. Yeah. Right, yeah. uh, so that's why I'm not sure about where. I know it's. I've got it written down on, on you know um, on my site about when, when the right time. But I can't remember off the top of my head. But mm. you'd obviously know because you were that soldier, weren't you? Yeah, <laughs> right. uh, it's a uh, yeah. Well, it, it's got to be my favorite, most favorite job in in the dive industry that I've done so far. Definitely. Did, have you? Did you manage to see the the white hammerheads while you were there? No, I didn't. No, no. I heard all the stories, but no, I didn't see them. And uh, would that be quite something? Yeah, yeah, it is. There were, in fact, there was one time. Um, I mean, I always dived with my camera, but regardless, always had the camera with me just in case they rocked up. I saw them quite a few times, but there's one particular time I had a, a couple come through, and it was pretty obvious that they were a bit nervous, and there was only these two at the resort. So we went out to Veals and I decided at the last minute I'm going to leave my camera on the boat because <laughs> if it gets a little bit choppy right. when we're coming back up, my camera's going to get kicked, it's going to get damaged, right. I'm just going to leave it on the boat, make sure it's safe. And the very first thing we see when we drop in, <laughs> leucistic hammerhead or white hammerhead uh, going into like the the mating ritual of, oh my goodness. you know, <laughs> and it's like five meters away from us. And we're looking at these two and they've got cameras on the go. I'm thinking, oh God, I hope you've got some bloody good footage here. And we saw it in the bar afterwards. Yeah, it was good footage. As long as you're really drunk and you could focus. And <laughs> <laughs> I wish they had a GoPro 7 with a decent stabilization stuff, I tell you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, pain. But um, so did um, you you done all the reefs out there. Did you get out to the, the chain reefs going over? Um, so you've got like um, Veals and Mulloway and yep. Cyclone. Yep. Did they take you out? Further afield, uh, no. Veals is about the furthest I, I I got to. Okay, and 
again, what would you propose divers would go there for? What's the attraction for you? Uh, well, it, it, you've got these beautiful like sea mounts and and that you know come up from the depths, swept by rich currents, with the chance of I mean on the sea mounts themselves, beautiful. Mm. Right, but then what's out in the blue? You you just never know what's going to pass. Yeah. So it's for me, it's like a, it's adventurous and incredibly scenic. Yes, is what I like about it. So for photography, you know, I, I, if I was going, I don't think I ever took a macro setup <laughs> out there. Yeah. Whereas you know, I, I I maybe did a couple of dives in the fields with with wide angle. Mm. But it was mainly macro in the fields, yeah, and and around the underneath the jetties, very much macro. But you're going out to the offshore reef, you know, you want wide as as wide as you got, yes, uh, because you can fill the frame with all sorts of stuff on the sea mounts, and then you never know what's going to come in. Mm. So it's you know a, a nice touch of adventure, beautiful scenery, yeah, and the chance of an apologetic encounter, yeah. Well, next time you get out there, get the boys to take you out to Trio. Trio, well, yeah. Well, it's one of the reefs. Uh, I think we, we discovered another, or Matt, oh, okay. 12 more reefs. Well, um, A Trio is, there's three currents that come through on these on these reefs, and it's just ballistic. Wow. Well, um, but in, in general, um, for those people who are thinking about going to Tufi, um, you go in those months that we mentioned, and you get out onto the outer reefs, the majority of the reefs come up to as shallow as 10 metres and in you know one instance going in cyclone reef, it actually breaks the surface. Yeah. So if you've never broken an hour's dive before, you're going to do it in two feet. Mm. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, you can spend, you can be down to 50, 60 bar and then spend another half an hour on the top. It's that shallow. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and there's some nice stuff, you, you, you know, you, the, the sunlight comes bursting through, you've got some mm-hmm. nice hard corals there, you know, I mean, it, great to just um potter around with your wide angle lens looking for the sun where the sun's shining in the right way and you know doing it's just a beautiful peaceful place you know uh, on the top yeah but as you go down the sides then it changes and it becomes more adventurous yes you know so you've you've got a a kind of a unique combination there yeah and that you know you're right you don't know what's going to turn up um we we did a, a quick couple of dives for the um the aussie navy um, back in 2017, trying to find a um, an anchor that they'd lost in a storm, and they they dropped us in on a bombie that we didn't even know existed. Mm. You know, they used wow. their their radar on the boat, and we dropped down to. I mean, the first attempt they dropped us in off a tender, and we headed down the line, and they they put a shot line in and completely missed the bombie. So we're at 42 meters, and okay, let's go back up. Clear blue water everywhere, and lo and behold, uh, sharks rock up. Out of, out of nowhere mm. and these were these were big uh, oceanic white tips mm. you uh, know so much so that you got a bit of an arse twitch when you turn around and seen them just <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah I've seen some amazing stuff there and yeah lots of lots of hammerhead encounters so that's Tufi um, where are we going to next uh, let's not forget there's some good diving in Port Moresby yes so the surprisingly good diving so close to a, uh, a capital city so the um, there's two ways of doing it. Uh, there's uh, John Miller runs a, um, a land-based operation mm-hmm. uh, using the Solitaire, which is which was Bob Holster's original boat, I believe, back okay. in the day. Yeah. So John Miller uh, does day dives out of uh, Moresby, and then Lolo Lolo Arto, which used to be the uh, a diving resort. It wasn't um, as exactly flash but it's all been done up now really dick knight was the owner of um and it's been sold and completely redone it looks super it looks super, super and it opened yeah. just before covid you know <laughs> <laughs> so you know they the, the, they must be really i've really done it tough you know a lot of money a huge amount of money i would imagine was spent out there and yeah. it just opened and you know and they got hit by covid um but there's it's the um uh, it's called a sunken barrier reef that runs. That, that's why Moresby is a good anchorage because they've got this reef uh, systems out there, mm. and out there are you know some beautiful reefs and some wrecks. 
yeah. that have been uh, deliberately sunk. There's a Pacific Gas, which is a great wreck, really nice wreck, and a couple of a smaller um, and there's a smaller uh, ships, and there's a couple of small airplanes which aren't particularly great, but you know it's it's it's, it's you know it's an interesting dive. Yeah. Uh, but the best wreck dive is the Pacific Gas, in my in my opinion. But there's some great stuff on the bombies. Really great stuff. A great place to see rhinopias. There's uh, pygmies, pygmy seahorses. You get schooling barracuda that'll just, you know, skirkle you and sweet lips that'll just come right up to you. It's mm. really quite something. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't expect, it, you know, uh, uh, so close to a capital city. So uh, a good way, you know, if you're doing a big trip to Papua New Guinea is to break your journey and do a couple of days either at the beginning or the end of your trip mm -hmm. in Moresby. Don't overlook it. Don't, yeah. you know, don't, don't, you know, it's, it's not all rascals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a life and death experience is, you know, the, the, as we said earlier, the, 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 it's quite safe provided you use your common sense and what have you. Hmm. And there's some good diving there. Yeah. To be honest, um, I heard there was good diving there and I never really believed it until um, Tristan and Yasmin started posting photos quite a few photos a uh, number of years ago now i think and i was i was taken aback i was quite surprised by it, it it's surprisingly good it's yeah. you know there's some really beautiful bombies out there and uh, and then you got the the wrecks and you know really you, you could do t easily you know 10 to 14 days diving it yeah you really could you know there's yeah. a large number of sites um the, the, the only thing is is the weather you know you, you've got to be out early in the morning and get your two dives in because typically the, the the wind blows up in the afternoon and you can be up to an hour to an hour and a half from the resort. Yeah. And it can get rough, rough getting back. So typically, you know, you go out early, get your two dives in, come back and do the afternoon dive somewhere around um, uh, Lolawato, you know, whenever I've stayed there. Yeah. And there's good muck diving around there. So, you know, you go out in the, after in the morning, we wide angle or, you know, Typically wide angle, I, I go for, and I come back, change over, and do um, some critter diving in the afternoon. Yeah, no, fair one. Mm. Yeah. So if you get if you get stuck and you've got uh, delayed flights and all that kind of thing, just drop in and have a dive with John Miller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, well, and you know John's a good guy. He really know he knows that area extremely well. Well, he should do. He's been there long enough. He's been there long enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. He's been there donkeys. I don't know how many years, but it's a lot, as long as I've been going, he's been he's been there. Yeah. Yeah. How's your beer going? You I'm going. I'm good. I'm cool. Okay, don't don't get me drunk. You, you know, don't want, you don't want to top up or anything. Um, no, I'm okay just yet. Um, sure. Okay, if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll get we'll get another beer. See, that's that's the beauty of um, recording and then editing. Those two minutes of me going getting the beers. <laughs> <laughs> I can just edit it out. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Cheers, all been. Cheers, cheers, mate. Okay, so oh. uh, the, the, before we move off um, off from uh, New Guinea Island, um, mm. the last place I've not been there myself. Actually, I know a few people who have, and that's Madang. Yeah, up, up on the. Uh, now I've heard good things about it. Me too. Uh, I've just never had chance to go there. I, I, I nearly went a couple of times, and so, you know something got in the way, and I couldn't do it. Mm. Uh, but it's well worth um, uh, considering because there's some good stuff up there, and uh, up in that area, further up, you get into the you know there's no diving there, but you get the Sepik River and some of the fantastic uh, above water stuff. Yeah, you know uh, the, the I've never actually done it. Um, combined a land trip with a diving trip because of the logistical challenges of taking all the different stuff, you know. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, so I've never actually done it, but I, I have, uh, I've gone for land trips, right, separate from me diving. Yeah. Uh, but I've never combined land and and uh, and underwater because of the just the the logistics of all the stuff you know you take. Yeah. But there's some phenomenal things on the uh, the main island of New Guinea up in the mountains and the highlands, as they call it, and the Sepik River is just phenomenal. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it's that that that's the that's the our Africa part. Well, we uh, yeah. Well, just to just to back that up, actually, I've just I just remembered um, when I was going out there, started well back in the 2016, started 2017. 
I was doing a lot of research. You know, you've got to learn where you're going to be living. Right. And I was surprised to find that Papua New Guinea um, is still um, finding or discovering, at that time when I read it, was a, a, over 112 new species of animal every year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's phenomenally uh, biodiverse above water. Yeah. Phenomenally so, you know, and, and uh, up in the... <laughs> the really the thing that fascinates me about above water in um, in Papua New Guinea is that when it was first discovered uh, by the European, it was the Spanish who first got there, and the, but all the Europeans um, uh, during the you know the, the the Spice Age when they were looking for the source of the spices and in, in um, which is in the in the Bandas in Indonesia mm. when they were looking for all that, uh, they discovered the island of New Guinea. And they huge island, second largest in the world. Yeah. And if you look from the north coast, you see this huge mountain range that goes up. Yeah. If you look from the south coast, you see this huge mountain range that goes <laughs> up. And and the assumption was it's the same mountain range. Yeah. What nobody knew was there's two mountain ranges, and yeah. there's a huge rift valley that goes all the way across this. Massive island, yeah, and in that rift valley is uh, Jurassic Park. It's it's kind of like <laughs> Jurassic. Park. Well, first contact was only made there in the 1930s. Yeah, literally first contact. Yeah, and in what we call Papua New Guinea now, which is the eastern half mm -hmm. of of the island, that first contact was made by an Australian called Michael Leahy from Toowoomba in yeah. Queensland. Yeah who was actually looking for gold. Yep. And he walked over into the valley, and it's the first time any of the people had seen a white man. Mm. And they thought it was a spirit. Yeah. And so they fell down, you know, uh, and, and uh, that, that's how he got through. But the trouble was, by the time he, came, he was on his way back, they kind of got, got over the idea, <laughs> and he got a bit dangerous on the way back. Yeah. Now, the unbelievable thing about Michael Leahy was, that this is 1932. Mm. He had a camera, he had a Leica camera, and he photographed it all. Yeah. And he kept copious notes, and they wrote it all up. And it's all, you know, if you read that story, you know, I, 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 I like to think I'm adventurous, you know, I've done mm. stuff. But you read what these guys did, 1932, walking over the mountain into this Rift Valley, kind of Jurassic Park, and discovered all these tribes, which were in a constant state of flux and war with each other. Yeah. You know... <laughs> And and they would be comfortable just, you know... That, that's what you call adventure. Putting you, know? you down. That's yeah. what you call adventure, <laughs> you know. And he documented it all. There's a fantastic story about them being resupplied. So the... Because the, they only had so much stuff. Mm. That, and they had porters and all the rest of it. So the arrangement was that a plane would come up on a certain date. So prior to that day, but they didn't know where, but they they, they would signal it with a fire. Yeah. So they got to a certain place about a week before, and they managed to get, through sign language, get the locals to clear an area and tamp it all down manually by, with feet, yeah. tamp it all down to make an impromptu airstrip. Right? And then they lit the fire on the you know, specific day, mm. and the plane come in. Right? Oh. Now, but these villagers had never seen a plane before. They thought, it was, they thought it was a giant bird or something. <laughs> and, it was all, and he photographed it. Yeah, as it happened, I mean, I, you know, I think I've seen the, the there's footage, in the, there's video footage. As yeah, well, there's, there? a, there's a there's it's called First Contact. So yeah. it's uh, there's uh, an Australian uh, guy called Bob Connolly, and his wife. Unfortunately, his wife passed away, but mm. uh, he found all this stuff uh, that he that Michael and he compiled it all, and it's called First Contact. There's a book and there's a film. Yeah, uh, that's been done. You can buy it on DVD actually. Yeah. Uh, but just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. So those, that tribal system, all that, you know, all the things that uh, Michael Leahy found back in 1932, that still exists in a form up there. Yeah. They're still tribes. They're still, you know, it's still partial warfare going on. And, and but there's, there's lodges that have been established up there where you can go and stay, all quite safe, and you can get... Immersed in all these cultural differences, shall we say, of all these different tribes. Yeah. The mud men and, you know, 
This is it's unique. Now they do have the big festival every year. Don't yeah, they? The, the, so there's the, the they have uh, there's several actually. There's a mm. couple. There's the there's the Groka Festival. There's the that's the one it? I'm thinking of. Yeah. Ma, uh, Marobi. Yeah, Marobi. There's that's another one where because they've got the, the they have there's a village there where the um, the dead are on display. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had the trip book there uh, pre-COVID. I had to cancel it. <laughs> Going by motorcycle, actually, that's, which is my <laughs> other hobby. <laughs> oh, good on you. That, that'll be another podcast. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> anyway, the, 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 uh, there's the Garoka. Oh, my God. It'll come back to me. Anyway, But there's several festivals up there that you can do. Mm. You have to book up a year in advance. All yeah. the accommodation gets booked up. You can do it independently, but a lot of the accommodation gets booked by trip leaders. Yeah. You know, so you might, you know, if you leave it too late, you'll have to go with them, right? But absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I've got a, a, a Navy mate who worked out in PNG for a good number of years. He's only literally just come back, been posted back into Australia now, BJ. And um, if you want to see some of the, I'm assuming, have you got any photos on here of the Mud Men and the Groker? No, I haven't. Like no, no, I haven't done, I haven't done yeah. that yet. Yeah. So B, BJ. Um, what's BJ's? I can't remember BJ. I'm talking about my mate, and I can't even remember his website now. Um, to be B, 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 BJ, BJG Productions, BJG Productions. You have a look on there, and you'll see all the the dress, the traditional dress that the guys come out in, and they're so proud of it, aren't they? Yeah. Oh yeah. It yeah, looks yeah. spectacular. It's unbelievable. It's mm. like you know, that's what I mean. It's our Africa. It's it like, is. It, it, none of that stuff. Uh, Aboriginal culture has its you know, uh, special things. Mm. But it's, in my experience anyway, um, the the PNG tribal culture has so much more. Yeah. And visually, it's phenomenal. It is stunning, isn't it? It's stunning, yeah. So, you know, uh, th- that's... About, underwater is great, fantastic, as we've uh, we've been to death here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but above water, there's some phenomenal things to see. Yeah. For sure. Ah, where are we going? Where's next? Okay, over to so if you if you look at the areas of uh, from a diving perspective, mm. uh, there's like three main areas. There's New Guinea, which we just talked about. Yep. And then going east, there's the second island of um, Papua New Guinea. It's called New Britain, which isn't a small island either. No, it? it's a very big island um, with an incredible top- topography. Mm. The visually defining aspect of New Britain is the volcanoes. Yeah. And the mountain ranges. So you've got a, a few different... It, it, on the map, it looks like one continuous thing, but they're, they're actually different mountain ranges, but they separates the north from the south. Right. And so high are those mountain ranges that they create different weather patterns. So when it's the rainy season in the north, it's a dry season in the south and vice versa. (laughs) And when it's rainy in the south, it's one of the wettest places on the planet. Really? Metres of rain. Metres of rain falls there, right? Um, So on the north coast, uh, the the main area of diving is Kimby Bay. So Kimby is to New Britain what Milne Bay is to New Guinea Island. Gotcha. Right, so it's this huge bay with phenomenal biodiversity and there's a a line of thought shall we say in the scientific community that that's where corals hard corals first emerged what what makes me think that it's a combination of you know, what, what if you look at the currents and i've kind of explained this on my website so you've got you've got that indonesian through through flow that comes down the north coast mm-hmm and then you've got the equatorial current that is coming in from the east. The east, yeah. right? And it comes up underneath the Solomon Sea, which brings up all the upwellings. That's in the south. Yeah. Then it comes round uh, in between New Guinea and New Britain Island and between New Island and New Britain and yeah. comes into the Bismarck Sea. And then it circulates around the Bismarck Sea. Now, as it does that, it's got all this rich nutrients, the eggs and larvae, you know, mm. and you get these swirling back currents into Kimby Bay. So you've got the sheltered environment with deep water, uh, which, you know, it, it itself creates upwelling. So it's like, a, it's like a, 
It's like a a massive petri dish. It's a, it's a washing machine for food, isn't it? it, it it's uh, you know it's like an incubator. Yeah, yeah. So if if you look around the world, there are places like this. You know, Baja California has mm. you know the, uh, the Sea of Cortez. Yeah. That's an incubator for that uh, that part of the world. Here in Australia, the Spencer Gulf mm. down in South Australia. That's an incubator for for that part of the world. Yeah. The incubator in the main, in my opinion, I'm not a scientist, but from everything I've read and seen, is in that Solomon Sea, which is unique because you've got the mixing of the Indonesian through flow and the equatorial current. Yeah. And all that stuff that comes with it, nutrients and eggs and larvae. Mm. And you've got this safe haven of Kimby Bay. Mm. with And because the... The currents circulate round the Bismarck Sea. You get side eddies going into Kimby Bay, right? And in Kimby Bay, you've got all the shelving reefs, and then you've got seamounts. Mm-hmm. So it's like a perfect environment. Yeah. So it's one of you know, in terms of biodiversity, it's certainly the hard coral capital of the world. Okay. And and there's tremendous other biodiversity there as well. Um. So. And, and there's an interesting story there as well, because uh, while uh, Bob Holstead did what he did for Milne Bay, yeah. uh, Max Benjamin and his wife Cecily mm-hmm. did the same for Kimby Bay. Now, they're based out of Willindy, aren't they? So Willindy is w- Willindy Plantation Resort. Now, Max, and, Max sadly passed away last year, yeah. uh, but Cecily's still very much... Um, on the scene, mm-hmm. and Willindy, the operation at Willindy is now run by uh, their son Shane. Okay, right. So what? Uh, Max and Cecily went to. Uh, they were actually on their way to Canada. They were emigrating to Canada, and they were offered a short-term assignment. They were both agronom- agronomists, and they were off- opera- offered an assignment in the Kimby area back in late seventies, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And they went there on a short-term assignment and never left. And they started to dive there. Yeah. And Max, what Max told me was that they, if all, <laughs> if all you know is what you know, and all your diving had done, been done in one location, then that's normal. Yeah. Right? So, for example, that, that here in Australia, down in Wyala, you talk to the local guys there, they thought, one of the best aggregations in the world is every May, June, July is the giant cuttlefish, mm-hmm. right? It's unique. It doesn't happen anywhere else on that scale that anybody knows about. They thought that was normal. Because that's all they've seen. Because that, it was normal. <laughs> you know, they go, you know, all these cuttlefish, right? Yeah. Right? That's what they'll tell you. Well, it's normal. Yeah. So for Max and Cecily, they were diving in Kimby Bay, and they thought it was normal. Yeah. This is what it's like everywhere. Yeah. Right? It's just like this off the British Isles. <laughs> <laughs> Buckley Brickworks Quarry, where I learned today. <laughs> it was my first proper dive, Buckley Brickworks Quarry, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so they actually went on a diving uh, vacation to the Red Sea. And they got there and they were, it was like, well, it's kind of better at home. Yeah. Right? And from there, it all that's you know they built the first resort. It was like two huts initially, yeah. But in just the same way as uh, Max wasn't say as prolific as Bob Holstead was in publishing. But what Max would do would he he would he would sponsor people. He'd go to the dive shows and he'd say to people, David Dubliet has done some fabulous stuff there. Mm. Come and see, mm. we'll show you. So he brought the big names in, yeah. And they established Kimby Bay as this stellar location. Yeah. Right? And that's how it, you know, and now it's grown and, you know, and, and then they put in the liverboards. So uh, there is um, um, Fabrina, yep. which is Alan Raby, who's also world famous. Um, ask anybody who's been diving a lot, you know, and they'll know Alan. Alan is like mm. one of the, he's an absolute, have you met him? I've not, no, no. Absolute character. Unbelievable character. So I could tell you some stories. <laughs> Perhaps <laughs> offline. <laughs> Hell of a character. Um, I, you know, I know the classic PNG guy, you know. Um, 
So he he um, he went there with Valerie Taylor, Ron and Valerie Taylor. They opened up the you know their first liverboard, and he got his own boat, and he's been there ever since. Yeah, they've had other boats operating out of there, and then a couple of years ago, Dan Johnson, who used to who used to run the diving at Willindy with his wife Cat, mm-hmm. they got Oceana and refurbished it on the beach just up the road from Kimby, really? from from Willindy. It's a fabulous job of rebuilding the whole thing. Yeah. Completely refurbished it. So they've got two liverboards operating from from um, Will Indy. So the, the great thing about Will Indy is it's day diving. Yeah. So you can do two to three, up to you, you can do three dives a day out on the reefs and the sea mounts. Mm. Fabulous, fabulous stuff, you know. Uh, then the liverboards go out and they, they, they also dive around the bay, but they'll dive at times you can't dive from the dive boats, from, you know, the day boats. Yeah. Which is really interesting. All my... Until I did it on the um, on the um, liverboards, you know, I, I thought I understood the mechanisms and the di- you know the dive sites, mm. but I was diving at a certain time of day. Every time, yeah, mm. more or less, because you leave you leave Will at eight o'clock in the morning, so you know, and it could take you thirty to sixty minutes, like kind of like two feet going out yeah. to the off, uh, 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 you know, the outer reefs. Yeah, you'd go out, but you'd be diving them. Once you get to know them, is you know there's like thirty odd sites, mm-hmm. but more or less you're diving in the same time window. Now, when you when you when you dive some of those some of the some of the best sites and you dive them from the liverboard, you you see a different thing. You see you you, you see a different aspect of the, the site you thought you knew so well. It's really interesting. So what? Uh, how do you mean? What makes it different then? Is it like feeding time? And feeding does... time, and it was just a different. You know, it's the same site, mm. but the behaviour is different. You see different things. The action's going off. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the best dives is uh, that I did on the last trip I was there. We dived. I think it was Bradford Shoals, which there's three main sea mounts. And when you say sea mounts, these come up from like 600 meters. Yeah, they're like a cathedral spire coming up from the depths. You know. Yeah. And uh, they're like a beacon for stuff. You know, they've got their own ecosystem on the sea mount. <laughs> Literally, got their own ecosystem, yeah. and part of that ecosystem are passive pelagic. So you never know what you'll see. Mm. So I, I dive, I've dived all three sea mounts multiple times from the day boats. Mm. But we did a, an early morning dive, just dawn dive on Bradford, and it was phenomenal. There was all sorts of stuff happening that I hadn't seen there before. Yeah, really, really interesting. You know, so so. Uh, they do it at the beginning, at the end of the trips. Mm-hmm. So they go out. They, they, they operate out of, out of um, Willindy when they when they base from Kimby, right? Um, and they go out and they go to uh, the to the east is going out of Kimby is the Fathers and uh, uh, Lollabow Island. Lollabow is a, a volcano, partially active volcano, volcanic island, yeah. and then there's all these reefs around it. Which have formed out of the volcanic ash, fantastic, you know, um, uh, fringing reefs, you know, just superb. Uh, and then going north west out of Kimby, there's a huge cold area out there called the Witu, Witu Islands. Yeah, there's the main island of the Witus, which is this. F- you 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 harbour it in the cold area. The, what it's kind of broken down at once, and you get into the cold area, and you can dive in the cold area. There's all these uh, this. Um, Two main, uh, you know, black sand critter sites. The way you, you can die, you know, there's all sorts of different critters in there. Mm. But really interesting experience because you're inside the cold area, you know. And then outside, there are all sorts of reefs out there, you know, which are phenomenal, you know. Just and, and there's only the two boats that dive there. Yeah, Oceana yeah. and Fabrina do. You know, the different times. They, 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 you know, they, they, you'll never be there at the same time. They, they work together. So they work together. Yeah. You know, they, you know, the same. You know, the singing off the same playbook sort of thing, but yeah. they work different times of the year and different, you know. So it's, um, you know, uh, uh, Fabrina is Alan. <laughs> yeah. You're on Alan's boat. Yeah. He's this tremendous character with phenomenal experience, you know, knows how to do it incredibly well, get him talking and, you know, he'll keep you amused for days. You give him uh, 10 beers to shut him up. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's just... An incredible character, you know, incredible character. Endless stories. That yeah. you, and and um, 
really interesting stories because he's he, he he really has done a lot to help the local people. Mm. You get him talking about that and some of the stuff he's done, you know, out of his own pocket to help people. You know, really great guy. You know, yeah. um, just endless array of stories. And anybody who's been, you know, diving for a while knows Alan and has an Alan story. You know, <laughs> an Alan story. <laughs> an Alan. <laughs> an Alan. He's, he's amazing. He's really interesting. Dan. Is Dan is Dan. Dan's um, uh, from London. Uh, got a bit of a Cockney accent. Uh, real character. Done a phenomenal job of building that boat. It's like mm. it, it really is pristine. He's you know he's every detail that you can possibly think of. He's he's attended to. Yeah. Beautiful boat. Um, and his vision is to uh, pre-COVID. Um, it was to dive the best locations in Papua New Guinea. Mm. Right, so he's got the itineraries around, uh, you know, the Witters and the Fathers and et cetera, but he relocates to uh, to Milne Bay, yeah. you know, in what he considers the best window, and then he dives the south coast on his way back, and he's looking at adding additional itineraries, you know, once COVID, re- you know, once we get the recovery from COVID. Mm. Uh, so, you know, great guy to talk to. He, he's very passionate about what he's doing. He really wants to you know, take people to places in Papua New Guinea that have not been dived for a long time or have never been dived. You know, he's you, you ask him, you get talking to him about where he's planning to go and it's like the juices start flowing. You think, wow, you know, this, you know, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be quite something. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, COVID. And, yeah. uh, well, hopefully they've used the time to go off and explore. Well, if, if you know, the, 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 they had to lock down and, you know, the, yeah. the, um, uh, I think Dan's been mainly uh, in Cairns. Uh, Alan, okay. Alan lives in, um, Dan's family's in, uh, he's got two kids and his wife's in Cairns. Uh, so I think he went back there. Um, and whereas Alan's, you know, Alan is Papua New Guinea, I think he's a citizen now. Yeah. Uh, and so he's been staying at um, in uh, Willindy. Well, if Dan's in Cairns... I should get him on the show because the uh, yeah you should the internet yeah. connection will be good enough to do a yeah a yeah chat. absolutely yeah really interesting guy uh, very passionate about what he's doing mm. can tell you all about it. like they ran the diving in Willindy in you know in Kimby Bay yeah. for I think five years five six years mm. uh, he's worked elsewhere but then he went back and you know because he had this dream of uh, of doing this level and he's he did it you yeah. know he, I mean the boat is quite something yeah um, and he wants to get to these other uh, interesting locations mm. that offer real adventure, you know, I, mm. I guess is the way I would describe it. You know, it's real adventure because, you know, it, it's not been dived. Maybe it has been dived before, but it's not been dived for a long time. That, that, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. It's so remote that yeah. there's very few people who've ever dived right, it. Right, right. And we, and we go back to, like, the Blackjack as an, a perfect example because when you visit Boga Boga Village... They, um, the villagers have a little notebook to put the yeah. number of divers in there yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> visited and charge you a little fee. Yeah. And I can remember one time diving it uh, with a year gap between the two dives that I did. And in that year gap between first dive and second dive, there was uh, less than 20 divers right. in, a, in a year. Right. And a lot of that, you've got to say a lot of that about the rest of the country as well. The way I did this is how I describe it. So I've, I've dived a lot in Indonesia as well. I've mm. probably dived as much in Indonesia as, as I have in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Rajarampa. Um on a scale of one to ten, where you know one is don't bother and ten is phenomenal. Yeah. In terms of um, reef diving, mm. uh, scenic, you know biodiversity type dive not big animals yeah big animals is you know is quite a separate thing yeah, but in yeah. terms of seascapes uh biodiversity you know rich ecosystems flourishing mm. in those currents rajarampa is in my opinion 9 out of 10 yeah right but you've got to know how to dive in big currents yes you sure. have to know how to dive in big currents 100% agree right and a lot of people don't like that. Yeah. They just don't like... I've heard, you know, I've spent a lot of time... In, I've heard a lot of... Well, we, we like the... But can, we, can you take us somewhere where there isn't any current? 
Well, <laughs> you're not going to get that yeah. unless you've got the. You're not going to get that biodiversity, those teeming reefs, yeah. unless you've got that current. Yeah. Now you get currents in Papua New Guinea, but not of the same magnitude. Yeah. Right. So I I I would class the best diving in Papua New Guinea is eight to eight and a half. Yeah. Probably eight. But you don't get the intense currents. Yeah. You, you get currents, but not on the same in scale of intensity. Well, you'll have your mask off, you know, if you're not careful. Mm. Right. Very manageable. And the big thing is it's exclusive. Yes. In in Rajarampa at the peak of the season, there's 60, 70 boats operating. Yeah. You, you, you have to queue up at the best sites. Right. You don't get that, haven't you? You're the only boat there. Yeah. If, you if it's a day boat, you're the only boat there. If it's a boat, you're the only boat there. Yeah. There's no queuing up. There's, it's totally exclusive. That's the beauty of it. It is. And over a 1,000 dives in Tufi alone, and I never saw another dive boat. Right. Right. Yeah. So th that's, you know, people say, well, which is best? Well, they're both phenomenal. Rajarampa and, you know, parts of the different parts of Papua New Guinea. Uh, but it's, in, in terms of overall... Phenomenal intensity. <laughs> yeah, Rajarampa is, you know, to die for in places, but you have to be able to dive in currents. Yeah. Right? You have to be able to manage that, and a lot of people don't like that. Yeah. They don't even know about it till they get there. Right? And then they're most uncomfortable. Yeah, and, and you get the downdrafts, and you get all the other stuff that goes with those currents. Mm. You know? So, to be honest, I've had, I've had customers come to me and say, Matt, can you book us a trip in Raja? And I know the divers, and I know their experience, and I've refused to do it. Right, right. I won't. I, I'm right. not going to take money off them because they're, they're going to do one dive and sit on the boat for a week. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, I, I've <coughs> seen people come off, come out of dives, Roger, out white, yeah, and disappear into the cabin for three days. I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I saw one fairly elderly lady. You know, she must be old because she was older than me. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, really old. You know, but you know, she got caught in a downdraft, and she she thought she was dying. Yeah, you know, it spat her out somewhere else. But she, you know, we got her out, and she got back on the boat. She went in the cabin. She didn't come out for three days till the end of the trip. Yeah. She was that petrified by the experience. Yeah, and you got to feel for people when it's that much of a shock. It's scary. Yeah, right. But you don't get that. I mean, you get currents, but mm. not of that intensity. Yeah. Plus, you've got a really decent amount of visibility right in, <laughs> right um i don't know what the uh visibility is like in the strongest current areas of raja or it, it can be phenomenal you know yeah. and it can be bad as well depends what you know you, the, the, there's there's a lot of um a variation there you know yeah. but, but that, that's the way i would describe it having you know spent a lot of time in both places hmm. so the, you know the, the great thing about papua new guinea is is tremendous biodiversity um, tremendous variety. Yes. You know, you've got you've got critter diving, you've got reef diving, you know, all that stuff. You don't, the, the, you, you do get, you know, the passing pelagics, but the wild animals, you can't guarantee anything. You know, mm. it's not like going to the Bahamas or something and it's January, it's, 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 it's hammerheads, you know. Yeah, you you're, do, not, you do, you're not sat on Tiger Beach with 10 divers no, and 40 exactly. sharks. No, exactly, yeah. right. But, you, you know, you've got the chance of seeing them. Yeah, um, but in terms of you know that those teeming, flourishing ecosystems, mm -hmm. you've got that w without the the negative side of the you know the the phenomenal, you know, terribly strong currents, you know, mm. and having to deal with all that. Mm. You know. Yeah. So, um, so that's the 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 Wittus, uh, the Farlands Lollabo, uh, and Kimby on the north coast. If you go. Uh, round to the eastern end of um, New Britain is Rabal. Uh -huh. Now, yep. Rabal used to be um, the wreck capital of Papua New Guinea and on a par with, um, it's not Trot Lagoon, but th there's a lot of Japanese wrecks in, that, in Simpson Harbour mm. that were uh, sunk at the end of the Second World War. It was a major naval base for the Japanese. Um, but... The two, two, there's five volcanoes around that, you know, the, the harbour, Simpson Harbour, is a caldera in itself, and there's five, I think, um, volcanoes around the rim, and two of them went off. I think it was, I can't remember the day, it was, I think, 97 or something? I can't remember off the top of my head. It's all on my site. Mm. 
Um, and one went off, and the next day the other went off. And uh, it just decimated the eastern half of the town. Yeah. Uh, and all the ash fell in the harbour and submerged the, a lot of the wrecks. Right. So it's not the wreck capital it, it, it was it back used then. To be. Yeah. But there's still some great diving there. There's some nice uh, macro stuff, and there's a couple of really good wrecks that you can dive. Right. Uh, so it's it's it's. I, I, I really like Rabal. Uh, it's a it's a nice uh, a nice place. Rabal itself, the town, used to be the capital, but you know, but after the explosions, it's been kind of decimated. It's so the capital's now Kokopo, further around, and mm. that's where the resorts are based and what have you. There's a couple of um, dive resorts there. And you've been to Kokopo, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you reckon on that one? Um, I, I enjoyed it. It was, um, uh, you know, both results are really nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, very nice, actually. Uh, and both have got dive operations that will take you out and um, and uh, take you to the, uh, the uh, out to the wrecks. And there's a, a Mitsubishi Zero wreck there as well. It's a nice dive. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, a couple of nice uh, muck dives or critter dives. You know, there's one. I bet my favourite is Johnny's Jetty. Mm-hmm. Uh, which has some really, really great stuff underneath the the jetty and on the pylons, loads of frogfish and stuff, you know. Oh, yeah, really, really, um, really enjoyed it. So yeah, R- Rabal is a is a good uh, a good location, and it's from Laba- Rabal that you go down to the south coast. Gotcha. So the south coast is you can only dive it for about six to eight weeks a year. Really? And, yeah, and there's only one boat because. When you're in the wet season, forget it, you know. So you've got, oh, to, get, yeah, you've got to get in the dry season. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, Oceana dives it on its way back from Milne Bay. Yeah. But it's only one trip, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So they're relocating. They, they, they dive Milne Bay, then they go up, and they go along the south coast mm. and end up in Rabal. That's where you get off, right? Okay. Whereas Fabrina dedicates itself there. Uh, in you know that uh, uh, January February window for about six weeks, six eight weeks, okay, and operates out of Rabal. So you, it's a you know you can get into Rabal, you can do some diving there at the resorts, and then you get on Fabrina, and then it's an overnight sail down through the St George's Channel mm. uh, onto the South Coast. And there's two main locations there: there's uh, Linden Harbour and Waterfall Bay, I think it's called. Uh, and really different diving, really interesting different diving. Mm. Uh, I've done it twice now. Um, the last time was last year. I went back uh, last year with Alan. Um, see if he had any new stories, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or if you can create some. <laughs> yeah, or if you can make some up. But the um, I, I really enjoy it. It's really adventurous down there, you know, because you, you are off the grid. Yeah. Uh, really off the grid, re- remote location. I was down there when uh, when COVID was breaking. Yeah. So we didn't know anything. We didn't know what had happened. You know, <laughs> we had no idea. Uh, and um, we we it was building. You know, but I thought, well, you know. And then we got back into Rabal, and because we were all on our phones, and it seemed like the world had ended. Yeah. And I was supposed to go from there over to Milne Bay to get go on Oceana to do Milne Bay. Yeah. And we had to bail out. Yeah. That was the uh, – I managed to get out the next day before their borders closed and our borders closed. Yeah, um, yeah that was quite, quite an experience. But the it, it's, um, it really is a, an off-the-grid, very interesting, quite different diving. There's, there's critters down there, um, but the, the reefs and the scenery, underwater scenery and the above-water scenery is uh, very interesting. Yeah, I, re- I really like it down there. Sounds good. Yeah. I need to do that one. Um, Cave Yang? Yeah, so the last, the last uh, spot on the map is the um, the musket-shaped um, island of New Island. Um, uh, New Island, I-R-E-L-A-N-D, as in uh, Ireland. Um, and uh, all the diving there is based around in the north uh, in Cave Yang. So Cave Yang is really interesting because... It's 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 a kind of a sleepy little place. The uh, it's been described as Somerset Morn type Pacific island village. You know, <laughs> it's a sleepy little town. Uh, very pleasant, uh, very, very safe. I don't remember any problems there. Mm. And there's two dive operators there. There's Lissanung, um, which is on the it's an island, Lissanung Island, mm-hmm. um, 
great place. I, I've, I've been there several times, uh, very well run. And then there's, uh, I, know, I can't remember, it, it's um, Dorian, his name, uh, Scuba, Scuba Ventures, I think it is, in, based actually in Kaviang. So the, what's significant about uh, that place is the, on the uh, northwestern side and the Pacific Ocean side mm-hmm. is uh, blue water. And you've got a lot of wrecks around the island, around the around the harbour, yeah. both in the um, there's a fishing boat out on um, on the uh, near the entrance to the harbour, uh, which is a really nice dive, and there's several different aircraft wrecks, uh, mainly Japanese um, uh, seaplanes. I'm, I'm, che- I'm cheating at the moment and flicking through your website. Yeah. The Japanese zeros and stuff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm speaking from memory here. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the um, great dives, but, you know, kind of uh, um, strong currents as well because going through Kaviang is the main passage of water out into the Bismarck Sea on, on the western side. Mm. So out on the northeast is the Pacific then you've got all the channels that go through um, into the Bismarck Sea. And um, um, when <laughs> – it's very complex tide-wise, yeah. right? You get up to six different tides going on during the day, right? But the basic six. thing is, yeah, it can be up to six. You, you need lo- you, It's not something you would do yourself. Yeah. You need local advice on when what to dive. And, and the operators know exactly what to do. You know, they've got it all – Nailed. But the the basic thing is, when it's good on one side, it's not on the other side. Yeah. Because of where the currents are going. So when the currents coming in from the Bismarck Sea, there are si- there are sites on the western side that are to die for. Yeah. Absolutely to die for. If you've got the clear water coming in, you're diving when the water's going out. It's been through all the mangroves and everything. It's kind of <laughs> all, you know, and it's like you can't you know you can't see a thing. It's yeah. like you know, wrong day. You should have been here yesterday, sort of thing. Pea soup. Uh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you, you need that local advice. Yeah. But really nice diving. Yeah. Really nice diving, and you can um, uh, listen on the, uh, the main uh, people who do it. But once a year, they do a trip up to New Hanover. So right at the top of New Island. There's another largest island called New Hanover, and that's where there's there's a couple of really interesting Japanese wrecks, including a complete mini sub. A complete mini sub, yeah, wow. uh, that's uh, just sat there in the in the sand. <laughs> a Japanese mini, yeah, the same as the the same min- type of mini sub that that, that uh, put the torpedoes here in Sydney Harbour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was found quite. Uh, um, Bob Holstead found it. He's done a lot as our Bob, hasn't he? He did a lot, Bob. Yeah, he, did, he really did. He had a he had a, uh, a really great career, you know. Yeah. Him, Bob Holstead, Rob Van der Loos, Max Benjamin, you know, uh, Rod. P- these are the Alan. These are the real characters. They, 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 that's one of the things I will really love about it. talking to, getting to know, and talking to those guys mm. over the years. I've been there. Has been one of the real delights of it all, you know. I've, yeah. uh, you, you get them talking about what they've done, and it's like I feel like I've not done anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, 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 they have created businesses in difficult locations, um, which are you know highly functional. Yeah, and they do, you know, they get you in and they, they do it safely. And they've had some great fun along the way. You get them going about some of the stuff they've done, and it's like, my God, you know, <laughs> what a journey these these guys have been on. Yeah. Love it. Well, the thing is, I mean, you say it, it's as though you've not done anything, but, I mean, you look at your website, and you, you would argue that you've probably got um, the most detail on Papua New Guinea diving on any website that you're going to find out there. There's, uh, I, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing else like it. I, I Yeah. I, uh, I completely I, agree. Uh, I sometimes wonder why I do it. Because you're addicted. <laughs> uh, yeah, but why do I spend all this time? Well, I can tell you why I do it, because uh, if you, it's very easy to get sucked into going from one trip to another. Mm. One of the big things I've had out of COVID is that, you know, I, well, I couldn't travel. So I was, I thought, what am I going to do? You know, so I thought, well, I need to get my website up to date. Mm. And then I went back and I found stuff that I'd done 
on different, you know, as I've updated all the different locations, you know, I'd forgotten about this stuff I'd done. Yeah. And uh, I, I have quite a good memory. Um, but when I really get into it and I'm looking at my images, I can remember the dive. I can remember the specific dive. Yeah. I, you know, if you ask me, well, what do you, what was so and so? I don't know. It was blue. You know, it was like wet. <laughs> it was wet and blue. I think. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but then when I look at the images from the dive, I can remember it all. Yeah. And it all comes back to me. And I, I try to, you know, explain all that on my site. And um, you know, I, I do it because I like doing it. Yeah. And I mean, another thing we've not even touched on it. We've talked about Papua New Guinea, and I think what we're going to have to do is just. If if you want to come back for more beers at some time in the future, we'll um, we'll look at the other stuff because there's so many locations and we can talk about all the 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 big animal photography you've been doing and we've not even I don't even know what camera you use you know <laughs> well um, will will my wife be able to hear this yeah <laughs> oh it's just this little uh, you know uh, it's a little compact isn't it <laughs> no I yeah anyway we can talk about that but yeah I what what basically happened was I I uh, for a long time I was concentrating on Indonesia and Papua New Guinea mm. and then back in 2014 I got into big animals yeah so I, you know, I, I did like the manatees and then Tonga and then I went, I did the Bahamas, several trips to the Bahamas for all the sharks and then, mm. um, you know, all these different places mm. because it's a ho- whole different genre, a whole different skill set um, than, than photographing reefs and you know, all the stuff I'd done before. Yeah. So, you know, you can really get addicted to that as well, you know, and I, I kind of did you know i was going from one trip to another and um and um i I really i wasn't making the most out of the images i've took yeah so i've you know over the last 13 months i've revisited all that and i've done a lot of articles and written a lot about about those experiences and i I, you know I, i really do enjoy writing about it it's um um you know, it adds another dimension to to my experience of what I did. Yeah, and and you do write very very well. Thank you. I must admit, um, which isn't a lot from me because I don't read much. But, uh, <laughs> the missus does. She tells me that you write very well. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Praise indeed. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think what we'll do. Let's let's wrap it up tonight and have another beer. Yeah. And um, if uh, it, it, I, I'd love you to come back and we we'll just do some more on you know the camera work that you've done and the the other locations and the big animals we got loads of episodes in just in you <laughs> <laughs> well I, I enjoy it i mean I, I as you can probably tell i'm very passionate about it and uh, yeah. um I, I just i just love the whole thing you know of um of you know being underwater and the different aspects and i, I think that the thing that i've really got of from the last I guess seven to ten years is an understand a better understanding of how it all works. Yeah, you know, you you, you see these things. I mean, if you do, you, you you go to Rajarampa and you see stuff there, you know, and, and and if that's all you've seen, you don't really understand the mechanism. Mm. What, what? Why is that stuff there? What's going on here? Mm. You, you're just kind of in this like. You're in the goldfish bowl yes. rather than looking into the goldfish bowl, you know. Yeah. But why is the goldfish bowl there? Uh, you know, where does all this stuff, what does that happen? Mm. And then when you get into big animals, you know, why why do the whales go to Tonga every year? And, you know, uh, how did that all that happen? And how many are there? And what are the encounters you can have there? You go to the Bahamas. What? Why are the sharks there? Why, why do you get oceanic white tips off the end of Cat Island. Why are they there? Mm. You know, uh, why are the hammerheads in Bimini, etc.? cetera? Why, why Tiger Beach? Why is it that you've got all the, you've, you know, tiger sharks and hammerheads? Tigers are one of the big three most dangerous sharks, and yet yeah. they seem like puppies there. Yeah. Why, why are they like that? You know, and understanding that mechanism takes a lot of reading on my part. And, uh, you know, I, I like to underside, understand it and conceptualise it, and I like to play it back. Mm. And that's what I do in my articles and what I put on my website. That's that's my... I might not be completely accurate. Mm. 
but, but then I, then that's it's your opinion. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my it's opinion. It's your opinion based on on a lot of research and, 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 and research. empirical experience. Yeah. So yeah. I, I only ever use my images mm. of that site. I won't use images from another site or you know somewhere else. Yeah. So what you see is what I saw. Yeah. So that's what, if you like my integrity policy, mm. right? And then okay, so why is it there? So then I read and you know and I research and then if I find so I'll, I'll reference it, you know, so you can go and check what I found. Yeah. Right, and then I comp- I compile it all if you like, conceptualize it, and then I play it back in my articles. And I, I personally get, um, uh, you know, I get a lot from from doing that. I feel I uh, I feel I'm a better person. I'm, you know, I'm a better person to have a beer with. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it's a goat beer. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you one more question before yeah. we wrap it up. Yeah. Seeing as the, I've not asked many people for a while now, but the title of the podcast is Scuba Goat. Goat being greatest of all time. So what would you say has been your goat dive? Oh, um, hmm, interesting. Um, there's been been so many good, you know, dives that at that point in time just kind of blew you away. Uh, whether that be, uh, I'll tell you, the, the, the most scared I've ever been mm. was doing the crocodiles in Mexico uh, in Chinchoro. I, I I did the crocodiles after doing a lot of shark stuff. Mm. I did sharks in Southern Africa and Bahamas and a few other places. And I got to a point where I understood the mechanism. I I could read the behaviour and I I had a big camera to protect myself, you know. Mm. And I I felt confident in the water with with sharks, right? Contrast that to when I first, my first ever big animal, so it was great whites down in, South Australia, I was petrified. <laughs> I, I was why. absolutely <laughs> petrified, right, when I did my first Great White trip. Yeah. And I got to a point where I was in in the water with oh, oh, no cage, you know, with yeah. tigers and whatever you, in different places. And I felt reasonably confident I could read the behaviour and I could read the danger signs, mm. right? Then you get in the water with crocodiles, and I, I, was, I was scared shitless, you know, because yeah. uh, they don't move. Mm. Like sharks are moving all the time, and you can. Got, but whereas the crocodiles just look at you, just <laughs> <laughs> look at you, you know, and you know, you know what's. Uh, so it, you know, I guess each thing is different. I, I I can't really give you the greatest of all time. They're, they're they're all special in their own little ways, you know. It's the most difficult question for an experienced diver. It really is. Yeah, well, okay, so I passed the test. Yeah, I, I failed the test, right? Sorry. <laughs> There's quite a few people who've struggled on it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough to say, you know. It's uh, the, um, you, you know, you get these sublime moments where it, it would have to be a big animal experience. I don't know which one, but there's, the way I always describe those big animal stuff, it's it's on their terms. Mm. You know, you, you, you typically have to travel long distances, to go to where these aggregations occur, yeah, right, and the interaction, the encounter occurs on their terms. They may or may not grace you with their presence, yeah. Uh, but when that happens, and they come in, then it's a question of the individual that you're dealing with. Now, so with sharks, there's not much. There's a feral cunning, cunning, cunning there. You know, with whales, there's an intelligence there. They're looking at you. You know, the, the ice is is reading. Doing, mantas are the same. Mantas look at you and, you know, uh, crocodiles look at you, just stare at you, though. Just give you a death stare. Just give you a death stare, <laughs> yeah. And it, it's very effective, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it would have to be the big animal. But which one, I, I don't know. But I can tell you what my favourite is. Go on. And that's here in Australia, the, the cuttlefish in Wyala. Oh, yeah? It's phenomenal. I thought you were going to say leafy sea dragons or something. No, 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 no. The cuttlefish. That 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 is. I'm going back again next month. It's about my fifth trip. Yeah. Um, it's it's amazing. It's it's all about sex, right? So th- this is <laughs> this is the big bull male's last chance. Yeah. Right? 
and all this interaction is going on in front of you, and they're all so preoccupied with sex yeah. that they, you, 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 you know, they, they just ignore you. So you can get, you get right in amongst it all, and it's just phenomenal when it's all gone. It reminds me of this disco I used to go when I was a young lad in. in <laughs> 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 Many years ago, uh, <laughs> but no, it's a phenomenal. It's, and, and it's just off the beach. Yeah, I mean, you just walk in and you're in amongst it. And yeah. the, the, there's literally over a hundred thousand of them aggregate in this area. Yeah, they're everywhere. So what you're saying is, of all the diving that you've done all around the world, with all the big stuff, all the little stuff, the amazing places that everyone wants to go, the bucket list locations, your favourite diving is watching a sex show underwater with cuttlefish. <laughs> that's one way of explaining it. Yeah, that's one way of explaining it, yeah. And on, on that note, I think we should move on. Yeah, yeah. Don, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure, buddy. And um, anyone who's listening, I'll put all of the, the links in the show notes. Um especially Don's website, the, the, the fantastic Indo-Pacific images. And uh, we'll have Don back on the show very soon to talk about a plethora of uh, um, bits and pieces and uh, drink a couple of more goats. Sound good, Chief? Thanks, mate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. This is Scuba Goat Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver.